Good evening. Welcome everyone to the Ward 5 City Council Candidate Forum. My name is Kitty Goggins and I will be your moderator this evening. Today's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul and Dock and Paddle and is in partnership with the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, District Councils 10, 5, and 6, Ayata Elites, Sustain St. Paul, and Reviving, Reviving Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment. It will last about 90 minutes. The League of Women Voters St. Paul conducts candidate forums to provide the public with the opportunity to hear candidates discuss the issues that are important to members of the public. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any political candidate or party. The views expressed in, of e in each forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. League of Women Voters Minnesota and our local leagues post complete unedited recordings of forums. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums may not be used for partisan or political purposes. We ask that members of the audience refrain from recording or taking pictures. Again, we will post a full unedited recording of tonight's forum on the SPNN YouTube page. We believe the success of our city depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office. It is with this understanding that, that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate candidates and the audience for taking the time to be with us here tonight or watching it online. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that all of the uh, cards that are on your chairs and on the tables are for writing questions to the candidates. Once you have a question, please hold it up and a volunteer will come pick it up from you. Today's forum is for the candidates running for office of Ward 5 City Council. Welcome, um, Wa Jung Kim, Pam Tollefson, David Greenwood Sanchez, and Nate Nitz. Thank you all for participating this evening. The candidates participating in today's forum have all agreed to the forum rules, which were included in their invitation for participation. Each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement. The candidates will then have one minute to answer questions, and if personally called on by name, an additional 30 seconds for a rebuttal. A timer will signal them when they have 30 seconds remaining and when their time is up. Candidates, when you see the stop card, the red card, you need to conclude. You will, can of course finish your sentence, but I will enforce this rule to make sure we give the same amount of time to each of the candidates. We will then conclude with each candidate having two minutes for a closing statement. We will use questions submitted in advance and questions from today's audience. All questions must be applicable to all candidates nonpartisan, and must be on topics relevant to the office. Once you have a question written, please hold it up and an usher will collect it. Questions that are unclear, partisan, embarrassing, inappropriate, hostile, or of a personal nature will not be asked. Questions that fall into the same general area will be cons consolidated to allow me to cover as many topics as possible in the time allotted. Cards become the property of the League of Women Voters. There is never enough time to cover all the issues, and if you feel that your question was not addressed, please feel free to ask the candidates after the forum. Campaign literature, buttons, clothing, or any campaign-related items are not allowed in the room, but information on candidates is available on the tables outside the room. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold applause until the forum has ended so that all candidates will have as much time as possible to answer the questions. Please place your cell phones on silent if you haven't already done so. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use, and the forum is being recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public.
Okay. Um, that brings us uh, to opening statements. And we will begin opening statements with David Greenwood Sanchez. You have two minutes. All right, hello, uh, and thanks to everyone for coming out here. It's good to see a lot of friendly faces. Um, my name is David Greenwood Sanchez. I have lived most of my life here in the Como neighborhood. Um, I'm a political scientist by training. I teach environmental politics and Latin American politics, and I've also spent a good deal of my life abroad over in Mexico and also in Peru and in Chile. Um, I'm running for city council in part because about four or five years ago, in my neighborhood, we had the historic St. Andrew's building. It was a church building, a very lovely building that meant a lot for our community and for a lot of the neighbors in the area. And what I saw, unfortunately, was that my neighbors got together. They did all the work that you would want, really from grassroots democracy, citizen organizations getting together, doing the right things um, to try to save this building. And they ran into a city, a city administration, that was completely hell-bent on not allowing them to, to go forward with what they wanted. Um, and in my, in my uh, role within the neighborhood, I saw that my neighbors were doing all of this work, and they really didn't have any voice. They didn't have democratic voice. They didn't have a way to speak to the city, and there weren't spaces for meaningful engagement. So really part of what I'm trying to do here is run and make sure that our city is understanding what citizens, what residents feel, what we're talking about, the issues that matter to us, and making sure that we have a space to get those into public policy. For the moment, we don't. We see this as issues, different issues that are popping up across the city um, in different neighborhoods beyond here in Como, uh, and they mean a lot. Um, and so uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to share my ideas with you, and I hope that you give me your full attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, David Greenwood Sanchez. Next, we have T Pam Tollefson. Hello, everybody. Thank you for showing up, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. I have lived in St. Paul my whole life, and I was blessed with two wonderful parents and they died in 2020. And when they died, I bought their house, which was my childhood house. And so I am very thankful for having my wonderful parents. I love St. Paul, and I know so many people love it too. But sadly, people are leaving, or they're thinking of leaving. I've talked to people as I've been door knocking, they're tired of the crime, the high taxes, the services that are expected but not being met, and a lot of people just don't feel like they're being heard. I think we need to listen to our residents, and nobody should feel like they're dismissed. And the reason I'm running also is because I wasn't happy with a lot of the things going on in the city, actually for the last several years. And the opportunity came now to say to myself, this is my time and I feel that I would be a great candidate or I am a good candidate and I decided to put my foot in the pail or whatever that saying is and I appreciate you listening to me and I welcome all the questions, thank you. Thank you, Pam Tollefson. Next we have Wajung Kim. Good evening, Ward 5. My name is Hwa Jung Kim. My pronouns are she, her. I am your DFL, DSA, and labor-endorsed candidate for Ward 5 St. Paul City Council. I'm very excited to be here with all of you. I am an organizer, a Korean-American, a nonprofit executive director, um, and at my core, I love organizing our community. I've spent the last six years working to elect people, women, progressives, um, into elected office to ensure that our community values are present at decision-making tables. Um, this work comes with a lot of time and energy, but also relationships. Um, I started out at my district council, like Nate. I worked my way up to the St. Paul Planning Commission, where I served all of you uh, on the zoning committee to make decisions there. Um, and ultimately, that led me to the Ward 5 office, where I was very proud to represent uh, constituents and to pass laws that feel like they're centered in community and to ultimately help govern the city of St. Paul. Um, I just want to also thank the district councils that have sponsored the event tonight. Uh, you are one of our greatest um, and most important assets for community engagement, and I really look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Wajong Kim. 
Next, we have Nate Nins. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, before I tell you about myself, and I'm going to go a little bit quicker, uh, I do want to say thank you to you all for being here, uh, also to my, my wife and children for allowing me to be here this evening uh, by doing all the things uh, to support me in this effort. I have greatly appreciated it, um, particularly my wife, Tasha. I know she's at home watching right now. So, um, And I also want to thank the League of Women Voters. I want to thank you all again for being here and our moderator this evening. Um, and I also want to thank the candidates. Uh, I am really impressed impressed with like how great you all are. So thank you all for being here today as well. Um, so yeah, my name is Nate Nins. Uh, at the core of it, I'm, I'm just a, a regular person, right? Um, I'm born and raised in St. Paul. I graduated from Humboldt High School 2004 from Hamlin University uh, a number of years later uh, after my after my time in the military, um, I served as an intelligence analyst in the Marine Corps and also uh, in the Army as well. Um, but my entire life has kind of been predicated on, on selfless service or, or service to community, right? Um, so after my time in the military, I, I was able to join uh, the St. Paul Public Library, where I was fortunate enough to be able to work at every library in the city. Uh, so if any of you recognize me, it might have been from there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm here because uh, I have a, a kind of wide variety of experience, right? I've met a lot of people in my time, and I know that at the the core of it, we all have a, a real set of shared values that oftentimes get gets overlooked or, or maybe maybe even not seen through some of the larger conversations uh, that we have. So um, really, I'm just here because I want to be able to try and facilitate some, some really good conversations with everyone in the city and bring an element of trust back to our, our government so that we can do the things that we want to do, knowing that it's, it, it is going to cost money. So restoring trust, building community, Nate Nins. Thank you, Nate Nins. I should tell you that we've used a random number order generator to determine the order of, of speakers for each question. Uh, the first question we have um, will be, to Pam Tollefson will be first, and it's, what are the greatest needs in Ward 5, and how would you work to address them and ensure that those who need help get it? So I repeat it, what are the greatest needs in Ward 5, and how would you work to address them and ensure that those who need it get it? So Pam? Ward 5 is kind of unique because we have so about four different neighborhoods with varying levels of income, rentals, immigrants. And so I would have to say Como area is a beautiful area. People are very happy. I've door knocked already all through Como. And I, what I'm hearing from them is their services and their taxes. I don't hear much about crime, and that is wonderful. But then you get over to the Rice Street area and North End, and it's pretty dismal over there. I'm going to have to be really honest. I'm door knocking in the Rice Street uh, east of Rice right now, and people are hopeless, and they're settling because they don't. They talk to the city about things, and they're not being heard. I talked to a man the other day that said, literally there was two different people on ends of the street shooting at each other. Please so, finish your sentence. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Keep um, my glasses on. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see sometimes. I'll try to prompt people if you go over. <laughs> um, Nate N Nins is next. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like um, a lot of the, the needs that we have are, are really common around the city, right? Um, and one of the things that I do in my current work is work with government organizations to make sure that they're using their technology um, to, to best serve their residents, right? And one of the gaps that I find in the, the way that we communicate our services and the way that we deliver our services is that we're often finding out about things maybe a couple of days ahead of them ha actually happening, right? And uh, it can be difficult when uh, we go to the website or we go to our, our office or whatever uh, to try and figure out what it is is actually going on and what kind of things we actually need. So as a person who is very focused on the user experience of not just this city, but cities generally, uh, I think our greatest need is just to make sure that we all know exactly what the heck is going on and what stuff is available to us to help us achieve the things that we're looking for. Thank you, uh, Nate. Uh, David? 
So I'm going to start by actually sharing Pam's division of, of Ward 5. I think that it is useful to think about it in different sections. And so right here in Como, I love Como. And again, I'm born and raised in the Como neighborhood. And I'd say we have it off pretty good. When you go to uh, the other side between Dale and, uh, and Rice, for example, you see some areas that are really in rough shape and that don't get attention from the city. Again, these are areas that also, you can look at the voter turnout, it's a lot lower. The city doesn't have the same incentives to give them attention. So I say here in Como, we have to be very cognizant of what we have and what some of the other parts of our ward don't have. Again, they're dealing with really deep issues of crime, insecurity, uh, lack of affordability in terms of housing as well. Um, and then the other part that I would add is that we also have kind of this lack of cohesion. Again, I've used Dale and Rice as my dividers, but you can look at it and across the ward, we don't really have that sense of togetherness. And so we need people who can bring those different parts together and create that shared vision. Thank you, uh, David. And we have uh, Wa Zhang. Yeah, so I cycle after cycle, um, I've knocked on thousands and thousands of doors each year, and I've really been able to gauge how issues have changed, how they stay the same, um, and how our response, our the response from our uh, city council has either improved their lives or it hasn't really made too much of a difference. Some of the issues that I see across the ward, and I do also appreciate the designation of neighborhoods, um, is affordable housing, um, combating climate change, uh, resourced community first public safety, um, and also honoring our workers across the city that have been keeping the lights on and protecting us from the global pandemic. They deserve workers' rights. Um, I also want to echo the connectivity of our neighborhood, and that's why I do feel so strongly that our district councils are such a great way for us to connect to one another um, so that we create more community safety because we know each other and also um, greater economic development so that we can thrive together and patron our local businesses and continue to um, grow grow our neighborhoods in a way that feels very centered on us. Thank you, Wajang. The next question we have is about zoning. Our current zoning policies prohibit retail stores, coffee shops, restaurants, and other neighborhood businesses in residential areas. This would be known as mixed-use zoning. Do you support zoning changes to allow mixed-use zoning? So do you support zoning changes to allow mixed-use zoning? And for this one, Awajang begins. Yes, uh, so yes, I absolutely support mixed use zoning. Uh, this is a land use tool that allows us to walk and buy, congregate and shop in the very neighborhoods that we live. Um, and this also means a greater level of connectivity and safety. When people um, other than the folks that live on your block care about your neighborhood, uh, that's very important to feeling like you belong, but also uh, that you care about the places that you visit. Um, as a former planning commissioning planning commissioner and your zoning committee member, I also have a history of voting in support of mixed use development as a way to continue to increase community safety and inclusivity. Thank you. Thank you, Wajang. Next we have David. Yeah, I, uh, I, I support mixed uh, housing. Um, in my case, though, I'll add a caveat that it also depends on what exactly it is that we're seeing. I think that there are a lot of cases where we see uh, mixed-use developments that aren't in the interest of our communities. And so it comes in with that caveat of we also have to be very aware of the type of businesses that are locating in them and the type of uh, housing that we're, we're trying to create when we create these mixes. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next we have Pam. I really think that there needs to be some scrutiny done about mixed um, zoning. I am, I think it's really beneficial in some areas of the city, but I don't know if all neighborhoods it would fit. So for me, um, part of the process is the scrutiny and then dealing with environmental tests to make sure there's no environmental damage, which did happen in Minneapolis. And we need to just really take some time and get input from residents. Um, I wouldn't want to say, I am for it. And then many, many of the residents in Como, for instance, say, we don't want this. We like how we are. Um, but I do think it can be beneficial for uh, some areas. So that's my response. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Next, we have Nate. 
Thank you. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I do broadly support mixed use zoning, right? Uh, it's, it's a tool that can be used to achieve a lot of different outcomes. Um, I, I currently serve uh, as a vice chair of the Star Board, and I'm, I'm the, the previous, um, or I was previously on the Land Use and uh, Housing Committee for District 6. So I, I can tell you that a lot of the things that we want to be able to do relies on the proper zoning to do it, right? Uh, and so if we want to be able to talk about incubating small businesses creatively, right, or providing some opportunities to have uh, a, a mixed kind of living space, working space, then we need to have a lot of these, these tools in our toolbox, so to speak, uh, to achieve those kinds of outcomes. Thank you. That moves us to question four. The future, this one provides, they've provided a fair amount of background, so I will read the background once and then I'll reread the question. The future of the I-94 can a corridor, which runs through the heart of St. Paul, is currently being reviewed by MnDOT in the Rethinking I-94 project. Sustained St. Paul and many others believe that the city deserves a future corridor that addresses historical harms to nearby neighborhoods, improves city connectivity across the highway, and reduces miles traveled and associated vehicle pollution. So what elements of the future corridor do you support? Some examples include a at-grade boulevard, a land bridge, a transit-only lane, and reducing the number of vehicle lanes or, or street width. So the question is, what elements of a future corridor do you support? Examples, at-grade boulevard, a land bridge, a transit-only lane, and reducing the number of vehicle lanes or street width. In this question, we begin with Hua Zhang. I would be in supportive of all of those options. They work in conjunction with one another. Um, I would advocate definitely against expanding I-94. I feel like whatever solution or the thing that we build needs to center the community that was most impacted by the construction of I-94. That's a Rondo community. Many of the residents that were displaced by the freeway moved across, uh, across the city and have been contributing greatly to our um, cultural and economic and um, uh, our music and culture here in St. Paul. And so we need to honor the legacy that um, the I-94 uh, left in those neighborhood, left in, with those residents, um, but specifically I would support creating a designated bus rapid transit line to reduce single car usage. Um, I would support the land bridge option as long as again, it centers um, generational wealth in the communities that um, we honestly just destroyed with the freeway. So I would be supportive of all those options and also as a way that we can continue to think about our climate resiliency here in St. Paul. Thank you, Warjan. Next is Pam. I would really have to think about and do some research and talk to experts about how it's going to affect the residents and the people that use 94. We're not just talking about um, people. We're talking about families going to emergencies and work. And so there's like 35,000 residents within the square mile that would be affected by this. And there's over a hundred and some thousand vehicles a day. So I think that that's any of the things that you talked about would be something to look at in the future, but it would definitely need to do have some data because I don't want people's lives affected that live in this city. Thank you, Pam. Nate? So broadly speaking, yeah, I, I do support the, the this nine, uh, 94 corridor expansion. Uh, the Where I, I want to make sure that we're kind of being clear here is that uh, this is not some sort of recompense for the damage that was done to the Rondo community. My, my family is historically Rondo community, right? So when we... Uh, when we talk about like the value that the 94 corridor brings and the damage that was done to our community so long so long ago or not so long ago really, uh, we need to be careful that what we're not saying is that this sort of construction is somehow a one-to-one -one trade or some sort of meaningful recompense for the actual damage that was done in our community. Thank you, Nate. We have David. Yeah, I'd like to, to address two points. The first is that you have to have real buy-in from community for these types of mega projects. And I haven't heard enough from our community members about what people think. Uh, and truthfully, I haven't heard a lot of drive from our, from our residents uh, in support of uh, some of these reforms. Um, the other part that I'd say is that 
it's really introductory at the moment. We don't have a lot of information, and there's kind of this saying that I like a lot for looking at policies and how we think about them, but it's, you know, God is everywhere and the devil's in the details. And it's really this idea that we really have to, before you say yes or no, we really have to be presented with the full packet of information about what this would entail and then also where that funding would come from. Thank you, David. Uh, the next question, do you support St. Paul's current rent control ordinance that caps increases at 3% annually and requires seeking an, ex an exemption for others? If not, what would an ideal policy look like? So the question is, what would an ideal uh, rent control ordinance policy look like? And this one will begin with Nate. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I, I do, again, generally surprised. This has got to be tiring for you all just hearing me say yes. Uh, but I, I do support this. Uh, and, and the reason for it is because uh, I'm, a, I'm a new homeowner, right? And I know that uh, a lot of folks are taking a really genuine risk, a, a large risk by choosing to rent out their properties, right? And it's not, uh, it's not uh, lost on me that changes to, to rent uh, or stabilizing rent over time is going to have an impact on homeowners and property owners, right? Uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we do have a really strong, thriving uh, working class, right? And it's a lot more difficult as somebody who moved from a garden-level apartment, right, to a house. It's a lot more difficult to do that when you are constantly having to chase meeting your rent, right? So if we can provide some sort of stabilization, at least uh, stabilization, at least for a period of time, so that folks can actually make their life and make their plans, uh, I think that's going to be beneficial official to us all. Thank you, Nate. Next, we have Pam. Um, I am for the rent stabilization. I think 3% is actually a fair uh, percentage. I've talked to landlords, and they have said that they usually don't even raise their rent more than 3%. I think there are several exemptions that benefit landlords, so they are able to raise the rent to 8%. Um, I'm kind of questioning, and I think that we really need to take some time, see how this rent ordinance works, if it works, and then we need to revisit some of the exemptions and make sure that residents or renters are not being displaced so that somebody can get more rent with what the exemption that we have in place. But otherwise, I am for rent control. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. David? Uh, no, I don't support the, the rent stabilization ordinance as currently uh, stated. Um, on one hand, I believe pretty strongly as a political scientist that we have to respect the will of the people. That's pretty absolute for all levels of governance. But at the same time, in this case, we had an ordinance that was passed with very limited details about what it would entail. And so you're voting, but we're not actually uh, outlining, all right, we have differences across different types of property owners, different renters, et cetera. And so again, the spirit of this ordinance was really designed to stop predatory landlords who were raising rates by 15, 20, 30, 50% in one year. Um, capping rent increases at 3% a year is not the right way to go. That can hurt us. And we saw it this last year because inflation was actually higher than 3%, which means that in real terms, you're asking landlords to incur a real loss each year by law. That's not right. Thank you, David. Hua Zhang? Um, I signed the petition, and I voted in support of rent stabilization as it was originally written. I testified up at the Capitol against uh, a bill that would effectively um, undo the impact of our ballot initiative just simply because legislators didn't like rent stabilization, specific ones. Um, and what's really important is that, um, A, this is a, like a fundamental tool of our democracy, and B, we trust voters. You, we trust you to vote us in, and we trust you to make decisions around what's best for our communities. Um, so this is a multi-year process. We have a lot of data that we still can collect. Um, we want to make sure that the impact of rent stabilization is actually serving the folks that most need it. Um, and ultimately, I believe that the kinds of funding or financing that is used to construct the building, and no matter how long ago it was built or how new it is, should not determine a person's right to stable housing. Thank you, Wajung. Our next question, if you are elected, what will you do to bring the voices of the people on the margins of our society, those who are low-income, homeless, immigrants, to the attention of the city council? So what will you do to bring the voices 
of the people on the margins of our society uh, to the attention of the city council. This question we begin with David. Well, I'm glad to start this one off. You know, I'm running to be the first Latino council member that the city of St. Paul has ever had. Uh, if you look at our governance in general, we don't have people who speak Spanish. We don't have representatives who have Latino backgrounds of any way. Go out in our ward towards the east side. You see a lot of communities. In fact, I've been out canvassing in Spanish with my mom. We talk to people who are so glad. They come up to us and say, yeah, put a sign up, talk to us. You know, nobody goes out there. Nobody reaches out to these communities. And so I think there's one which is just a very simple one visibility and having real people who represent the diversity of the city who are in positions of power. We don't have that. Um, and then the other one would be, again, reaching out to communities in meaningful ways and doing it earlier and doing it often. Thank you, David. Next we have Wajun. We actually have very committed organizations and volunteers um, here in St. Paul that are um, invested in continued civic engagement and community engagement around all things that happen at the city, and that's our district councils. They focus on land use, um, community safety, the lake when it smells funny, all of those things they are deeply invested in engaging with all of you around, and they are one of our um, greatest assets um, for this work. Um, and they have also small area plans where they're reaching out and engaging in community members, doing surveys, door knocking. Um, I also feel like the city still has a lot of opportunities with accessibility for language assistance, but right now if you call the city of St. Paul, they can respond to you in almost any language spoken or written. Um, we have a lot of cultural communities that are also here in St. Paul that I will partner with. And again, lastly, you know, I've spent the last six years door knocking. I talk to residents on their door every single year around the ways that the city is engaging, the way the cities can do better, um, and certainly uh, things that they want the city to do less of sometimes too. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. Pam? I think the community councils do an amazing job um, emailing people of events coming up and issues that are going on in the community. But I don't think a lot of people have emails and so they don't go on social media. So maybe the community councils do this, but I would think that we could send out postcards to uh, residents so that people can actually get the information. And I have found when I've been door knocking that there are a, a lot of Karen people and Karen is fairly new to the community, and um, the Hmong have been here for a long time, and I have something on my flyer in Hmong, and they can't even read it because they know English. But the Karen really need to have more um, language, people that speak the language, and Somalians and all the people that are missing the communication. We just need to really work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. We have Nate. Last. Yeah, thank you. Um, so like I said, I, I was a librarian uh, for many years. Um, and the last place I worked was at the, the Rice Street Library. I was fortunate enough to be able to work at uh, every library in the city of St. Paul. So I got to see and hear from people what they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And it has almost nothing to do with books 90% of the time. Uh, right? So I, I really have uh, the, the philosophy of meeting folks where they're at. Right? So uh, if I'm elected, you will be able to find me at uh, 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 Tromperia El Zac, or you'll be able to find me at Nanny's, or you'll be able to find me wherever else because I want to be able to hold office hours in the community so folks can actually reach out and touch me and say, hey, I need something from you. And it's not a kind of uh, one-off deal, right? So I'll be present around the community anyway. Uh, I'll be downstairs after this getting a beer. So if anybody wants to talk, then I'm happy to do that too. Thank you. Um, so that, Nate, that completes our answers to that question. Our next question, a nicotine-free generation ordinance, ordinance would prohibit vendors in St. Paul from ever selling tobacco products, vapes, cigars, cigarettes, to people born after January 1, 2004. Community organizations, the city council, and the mayor's office are currently exploring this ordinance. St. Paul would be the first major city in the U.S. to pursue such an ordinance. As a city council member, would you support a nicotine-free generation ordinance? As a city council member, would you support a nicotine-free generation ordinance? In this question, we begin with Wajung. 
Yes, we all just survived an upper respiratory pandemic. Um, while I was exiting City Hall, one of the last uh, citywide ordinances that I helped pass uh, with youth and the Anti-Smokers Association was uh, limiting and diminishing the amount of menthol products that are sold here in St. Paul, the inability to sell single, single cigarettes to children um, or single cigarettes at all, not even just to children. Um, and so I would be very, in, I would be in support of this. I don't feel like um, we have to create a culture of care um, and our ability to continue to sell nicotine when it's a public health crisis. Um, it just feels like um, certainly a phased process, but a, a bit of a no-brainer to me after everything that we've just survived. Thank you, Rajon. Pam? I would have to think about this because I'm, kind of wondering the hypocrisy of selling marijuana um, legally and then closing down nicotine tobacco stores. There's a lot of businesses. They um, have a good tax base for the city. But again, I would have to, I'm going to be honest, I would have to think about this. I'm not sure of an answer. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nate? I'm going to do something different, and I'm going to say no instead of yes this time. So no, <clears throat> generally speaking, I don't uh, I, I don't subscribe to to limiting people from from doing what they want to do to their own person. Right? We already have things uh, in place to try and keep folks from smoking right outside of buildings and not smoking around kids and things like this. These are all uh, common sense types measures, right? Uh, we, like Pam said, we just passed legalization of marijuana in this state, right? We sell booze. We know that these things are harmful to individuals' health. But life is already hard enough. Don't make it a little bit harder by <laughs> trying to outlaw some of the things that folks enjoy. Thank you, Nate. David? Yeah, I also agree that I, I, I would say no on this one. Um, to me, it strikes me as pretty clearly a, a form of ageism. Um, I don't think that's good for policy. I also think that government in general shouldn't be in, the, in kind of this business of picking who gets to do what based on their age. And also, if you think about it more long term, it has a lot of potential economic repercussions because it means that down the road, people who actually are nicotine users won't want to come to St. Paul because they won't be able to live here uh, while doing what they do. Thank you. Our next question, citizens are concerned about climate change. If elected, what environmental initiatives will you push for? And I know that's a huge question for a one minute answer. Citizens are concerned about climate change. If elected, what environmental initiatives will you push for? And this begins with Nate. I mean, I guess like, we can't give everyone a Tesla, right? So uh, I feel like some, some, again, more common sense type measures where if we want to talk about having a plastic bag tax or something like this, I feel like this is reasonable, right? Um, if there are opportunities where we can work with manufacturers to put bottling plants in the city where we can recycle at those plants and do some of those types of things, I think this makes a lot of sense, right? Um, I, I'm not going to pretend to be an environmental expert, right? Uh, but I am smart enough to know that I'm not smart enough to be one. Uh, so if I am elected, I will make sure that we're having those conversations with people who are much more educated in that area than I am. Thank you, Nate. Uh, next, we have David. Um, in my case, I'd support two things in particular. So one would be we clearly need to have systems in place that allow us to adapt to climate change, especially in terms of air quality. I think we saw that quite clearly this past year. Um, the other one that's very, very dear to me, we have to stop cutting down the trees in our city. There's a group that you can talk to, SOS Summit, who are trying to fight to preserve Summit Avenue, especially the 950 trees along Summit that are at risk of being pulled out and removed in order to create a bike lane. If we're serious about confronting climate change, let's start by not destroying 950 trees. Thank you, David. Ouajan? We have um, a lot of old housing stock in St. Paul. So um, the majority of our emissions comes from buildings and from houses. Um, so helping families weatherize their homes will be a really great way that we diminish emissions. Um, secondly, we can strengthen our energy codes to ensure that new development includes green infrastructure like solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal. Um, we also have a really great EV network right now that within the first six months with 100 cars has already reduced 741 metric tons of greenhouse gas. Our full fleet is about 175 cars. 
as we build up green infrastructure, I also want to be in conversation about green gentrification. Uh, the city of Minneapolis has a great program that focuses around green zones and having opportunities for folks to be close to green infrastructure and food, fresh food. Um, and these seem like very straightforward, uh, replicable programs for St. Paul. And very lastly, I'd be really interested in creating a youth climate justice advisory committee here in St. Paul. They are the people that are inheriting our planet. It is time that we center their voices at the table. Thank you, Wajong. And last, Pam. Everybody said good things. I uh, resonate with David about the trees, and we really need to save our trees. I think that we don't have to unnecessarily cut them down. I think we can up our recycling. I talked to a man earlier today that lives in Minneapolis, or lived in Minneapolis, and he said Minneapolis is so much more advanced in their recycling. I think we need to look at that. I love the EV vehicles. They're wonderful. I think that's a great service for people. And I would, um, I don't think we need to do things so quickly. I think we can gradually go into things, encourage hybrid vehicles. I think that's wonderful. Um, quickly, about 30 years ago, I stood on a landfill in Inver Grove Heights and I literally looked at tons of this garbage and it was horrible. But guess what? all that garbage, we're recycling now. So I think we can always do better. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. The next question, are you in favor or against the 1% sales tax referendum on the ballot? Why or why not? Are you in favor or against the 1% sales tax referendum on the ballot? Why or why not? So this one we begin with uh, Wa Jung. Yes, I am in support of the one cent sales tax. Um, so we have a lot of wonderful things in St. Paul. Um, it's a capital city. We have wonderful amenities here. And the one cent sales tax is essentially asking anyone that travels to St. Paul that may patron or purchase something here that they pay one cent in to, to help repair our deferred maintenance. It's basically saying, um, you use our streets, please contribute to help us repair them. We've got two decades of deferred maintenance here. Um, secondly, it also goes to our parks department. We have incredible regional resources that contribute to our regional resiliency, an ecosystem that we need to maintain, and it also has deferred maintenance. Um, one cent sales tax would allow us to continue to improve upon those, improve our deferred maintenance, um, and again, just contribute greatly to the region's um, resiliency, green resiliency. Thank you. Thank you, Wajang. Nate? Yeah, I, I am in favor of it. Sorry to go back to saying yes again. Um, but the reason I am is because uh, we hear oftentimes, uh, or regularly even, that the state of our roads are in unserviceable condition, or why are kids out not doing stuff when they could be at the rec center or whatever. All these things cost money, and we can't have it both ways, where we get better road work and more services without having more money in. That's These are the facts, right? But I think the hang-up here is, again, that we don't have a, a complicit trust or an implicit trust uh, in the folks that are, are handling our tax dollars so that they can go and do the things that they need to do, right? That are they are trying to do for all of us, right? And so that disconnect, that lack of trust is something that I would love to resolve uh, right away, right? By being out and being accessible, right? So uh, yes, in favor of it, but it requires trust. Thank you, Nate. David? I absolutely do not support the proposed 1% sales tax increase. It brings us up to nearly 10% in total sales tax. We'll have a 9.875% sales tax. That's quite a lot larger than what we have already. Um, the other part is that it really behooves us to understand the context through which this emerges. Um, St. Paul is in a budget crisis. It's not the fault of us, ordinary citizens, regular people who are struggling to make ends meet. It's the fault of the city council, which has been overusing TIF which is tax increment financing, as a way to fund and to attract investors to the city. So they attract investors, but they allow the investors to get off without paying their share of property taxes. That's why the city doesn't have money, and it's, dis it's really disingenuous and very, very, uh, in my mind, a superficial response to a problem that's structural and much deeper. So let's address the structural part and not just fix it with this 1% Band-Aid. Thank you, David. Pam? I'm never for raising taxes. However, I am concerned that if it doesn't pass, that our property taxes will go up. And my big concern is for the residents in Ward 5 specifically and in the city. And what I'm hearing from people is they're tapped out. 
They don't want their property taxes raised. So I think we're be, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with this situation. I think we could have found money elsewhere. And even though I am not for it, I'm also not for raising the property taxes. So I'm sorry, I'm kind of giving a iffy answer. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. The next question, what action do you do support to curb juvenile crime? What action do you support to curb juvenile crime? This one, we begin with Pam. I think that juvenile crime is such a sad situation. It affects the victims, the parents and families of these juveniles, and the juveniles themselves. We are the adults. We are the decision makers. We are doing a disservice to juveniles if we don't hold them accountable, have a facility so they can get rehabilitation and punishment. My fear is that these young people are gonna be 19, 20 years old. They're gonna end up in prison if we don't do something now. So I would really, I, I think that we are going in that direction. I heard that we're coming up with uh, having a facility and I think it's so important. These young people, we need to get them off the streets because it's calling their name and I'm very scared for them. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nate? Yeah, uh, it, is it my turn actually? I'll take it. I thought it was not. Okay, uh, deal. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I was one of those kids who was on the, the wrong track, so to speak, as, at, a, at a younger age. And what helped me was uh, an intervention program uh, that was put on uh, by Melvin Carter Jr. Um, so I, I graduated from that because uh, you know my dad died when I was very young. I didn't have uh, a, a, a strong kind of leadership influence in my life, right? Um, and now, uh, so anyway, to answer the question, I feel like uh, if we expand uh, OJT opportunities, service learning opportunities to kids in school, as well as reinstating some version of a neighborhood youth corps, uh, I think those two things would go a long way to, to give our kids something uh, more to invest in their futures so that uh, they have something to hold on to through their life. Thank you, Nate. Wajan? Uh, yeah, we have great uh, partnership with Ramsey County and the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. They run juvenile detention alternative initiatives um, that I'd be very interested in continuing to support, um, putting kids on the right track and making sure that they um, divert from sort of the behaviors that uh, are unsavory. Um, we also have an opportunity to continue to build out our rec programming and our library programming and doing it in, so in partnership with our schools to make sure that when kids walk out, they have strong community resources that they can tap into. Um, we can provide more youth jobs through our Right Track program that uh, connects young folks with their dream jobs or their dream sector. Um, and I absolutely agree with Nate. We have some really wonderful, like in the street, on the street interventions, like our community ambassador programs that continue to, um, to prove worthy of our investment. Thank you. Thank you, Wajang. David? So juvenile crime is a, a tricky issue to, to tackle, and I think it's disingenuous if we just mention one or two programs and projects that the city's doing uh, to confront it. I think that it really starts with community. We have to have comprehensive programs and initiatives that work to build community. I mentioned right at the start that from my perspective, when we look at Ward 5, it's, you know, it's split apart. We don't really have that cohesiveness. We're split apart in different sub-neighborhoods and we don't have that gel that brings us together a lot of the times. And so I think that one of the clear ways if we're trying to address this is we have to have A, an initiative, a clear focus on reconstructing our neighborhoods, rebuilding our communities and doing it in honest and real ways. Uh, a few other you know, programs that I'm, that I'm interested in and care about deeply, free lunch programs. Uh, we need to have good health and good nutrition for our, our kids, affordable housing to keep kids and people uh, off the streets, strong programs for uh, helping our mental health, and then also, again, returning to this idea of different uh, recreational opportunities and things to uh, for kids to do so that they're not on the streets. Thank you, David. The next question starts with a statement. St. Paul has a need for adult funding for our additional funding for our roads, bridges, and parks. Given this, would you change the mayor's proposed 2024 budget? If so, what choices would you propose? So would you change the mayor's proposed 2024 budget around roads, bridges, and parks? If so, what choices would you propose? This one, we begin with Pam. 
I'm going to say right now that I don't know about this. I have not seen the budget regarding the road, so I'm going to have to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have David. I uh, spent about a year of my life working for the Office of the Legislative Auditor on a very dry evaluation of pavement types. Um, one of the conclusions that we had is really across really across the state of Minnesota, that there's not a lot of investment in our roadways. And so one of my uh, uh, kind of pet peeves, when you drive around St. Paul especially, we see so many roads that have cracks that aren't getting fixed. And beyond cracks, they have holes, gigantic potholes. And I think I'm speaking to the choir here because uh, you guys all know this inside and out. But one of the really clear things that I, that I would change is more investment in our roads right from the start and also having them be very large and impactful and permanent investments uh, in our infrastructure, especially our roadways. Thank you, David. Nate? Yeah, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, the type who is interested in coming in and, and promoting a large upheaval or anything like this. Um, so I, I wouldn't be in favor of changing the, the current budget. But to David's earlier point, uh, there are some systemic issues that prevent us uh, from actually investing in the places that we need to. Uh, and by way of like kind of evaluating the programs that we've got, um, a lot of the, the dollars that are already going out the door, maybe there's some opportunity 2025, 26, where we can think about something where we're able to, to take from one department or and move into another so we can address our road work uh but without you know I, yeah I, i'm not interested in, in coming in and reinventing the wheel uh i'm more interested in, in taking over planning from day one thank you uh nate Wajang. I'm not interested in making significant changes to the plan. It continues um, the city's initiatives to create safer streets for everyone. Uh, that includes bike lanes, that includes sidewalks, that includes making sure that our infrastructure is strong. Um, hopefully we'll have a structural engineer on the council next year. Um, and you know, honestly, the deferred maintenance of the streets is a very popular uh, point of conversation. And um, sales tax is the only funding that we have to scale and the, the mayor um, has created a budget that um, will help balance um, the investment that we have in our current portfolio of street reconstruction projects. Um, and we also have significant sidewalk gaps across the city that uh, we need to make sure that we fill so that regardless if you roll or walk or bike, that you have a safe way to get around in St. Paul. Thank you, Varjan. The next question is, what is your position on acknowledging injustices that displaced and dehumanized Minnesota's indigenous population, especially in Ward 5? What is your position on acknowledging injustices that displaced and dehumanized Minnesota's indigenous population, especially in Ward 5? On this one, we begin with Nate. Yeah, I'm not sure that I, I, I clearly understand the question being posed here. Uh, but if, it, if the question is, uh, are we talking about land acknowledgments ahead of meetings? Uh, I think this makes sense, right? Um, w w one thing that is important to recognize is, is where we've come from, right? And without figuring out and without really acknowledging where we have come from and the, maybe some of the mistakes that we've made, it's very hard to stay in conversation about what is the proper way to go forward or what is the most kind of uh, communal way to go forward, right? So if, if this is a way for us to, uh, again, bring this kind of awareness to, to folks' uh, minds, at the forefront of their minds, uh, then I'm, I'm okay with this. Thank you, Nate. Next we have Wajang. Native and indigenous communities um, want an acknowledgement of what's been stolen from them, but they also want um, repair. They've been asking for their land back. They've been asking us for, to address our climate crisis. And to me, the way that we honor harms um, our past harms is by urgently and addressing our climate crisis um, and that we start connecting people back to the land and connecting them back to the culture in the way that they heal. Um, there's a few Native and Indigenous organizations that serve folks in Ward 5, um, and part of it is connecting them back to their Native and Indigenous food systems. Um, so I'd be very, uh, I'd be in support of programs that um, not just address, but uh, invest in that community and in the way in which they would like to heal. Thank you, Arjun. David? I think a good starting point is recognizing that when you're dealing with Indigenous communities, um, 
that you really ought to hear from them. I think that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have initiatives that start from the top down from our city council, but rather we need to have inclusion. And this goes back to the point of cohesiveness in our communities and spaces for marginalized communities to enter and to speak and have relations with our council and also uh, really at all levels of our government. Um, another point that's worth noting, uh, right here, this used to be Black Bear Crossings and it was run by one of the only successful Native American businessman, uh, David Glass in the area, he was kicked out of here illegally by our current city council president. I think that a really good starting place as well is to acknowledge, hey, when we have people from these underrepresented communities who are successful, let's give them the space to do what they want rather than determine from above who gets to see, succeed and who gets to fail. Thank you, David. Pam? I agree with David about talking to the actual people. The um, I'm not going to pretend to know what anybody else is going through and what they need to heal. So uh, communication is so important. We need to really go to those to people where they're at and find out what is going on, what, what, is their, what are their hurts, and what do they think that would remedy it. I think of uh, Mounds, Mounds Park a few years ago. There were, they were going to do some things to the burial mounds, and... It was really a decision to not to leave them alone. And I think it's, even though it's not in Ward 5, it's a symbol for me that we really need to be aware of what people are feeling and when they're hurting. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Next question. Other cities, like Bloomington and Roseville, have their streets cleared faster than we do in St. Paul. Residential streets often don't get cleared for days after a snow event, and by the time plows come through, the snow is so compact that plows have little effect. How will you work to improve the snow removal process for residents? How will you work to improve the snow removal process for residents? This one, we begin with David. Oh man, you gave me the hardest one. <laughs> um, I think one of the, the clear starting points is to really address that. Like, hey, this is an issue that's challenging the entire city. And so again, I've been out door knocking, um, one of the really cool things as a side note for door knocking is you get to go to a lot of the areas that you don't normally need to go to. And so they're little nooks. And again, St. Paul has this very particular and very awesome history in that there are a lot of neighborhoods that are, you know, they're interesting. And so we go there and I hear stories from people all the time that say, hey, the snow plows, they're not coming here. We've been ignored. And we write in, we write into our council member, we tell them, we ask them, come here, help us out. And they don't get any response. And so I think, again, one of the ideas is, you know, you start out by addressing it and saying, hey, this is a problem. And then two, again, by having clear channels of communication, ways to get input from below, from communities, and again, moving beyond the district council system. I think they do a great job and they have a, a service that they provide, but we need to have other forms of input so that when people have things that seem so banal, uh, seem so you know day to day, including snow shoveling, that they can still go ahead and have someone that they can at least talk to and get heard. Thank you. Uh, Nate, uh, David, uh, Wa Zhang? Um, I think everyone in the city knows that uh, snow plowing is definitely an issue. Um, in the Ward 5 office, I learned a lot about snow plowing. We plow 1,800 lanes of miles, lane miles in the city of St. Paul in the first 24 hours. Um, we do it in two shifts, an AM and PM shift. That means that the city workers are working around the clock 24 hours, and we do it in three phases, and that's determined by the parking rules in your neighborhood. Um, the city likes to talk about it as if it's a parking issue, but really it's like a cooperation issue. We need residents to move their cars. Um, if a plow comes through and your neighbor didn't move their car, then the city in some ways did their part. Um, so we really need to make sure that um, as your council member, I'll make sure that we open up um, our library parking lots, private parking lots, and working private partnerships to make sure that there's a safe place to park. Um, but also there's an app that people can sign up so that they know that there's a snow emergency when it happens. Um, and lastly, to provide better customer service, because I hear that's definitely an issue. Um, our, our truck drivers used to go around with paper clips, like papers on with clipboards. Now they have GPSs. So now we're able to provide better customer service because we can know the routes that were finished on time. Thank you, Wajang. Uh, Pam? I think one of the problems is they, the city doesn't have enough employees to handle the, the driving, the plowing. Um, we know when a storm is coming, we should be prepared. It shouldn't be two days when the plow is out, but I understand that issues arise. I think one of the problems are is the situation with people not removing their vehicles. It's very hard to plow around them. 
I don't like the idea of towing. I think it affects not just the driver of that car, but they have families and people that need to, to use it, and it's expensive to get out. I really would encourage um, partnering with ramps. There's ramps downtown. There's uh, libraries. There's schools that we need to partner with and see if people can easily put their vehicle over there so that they don't have to worry about where they're going to put their car. Um, other than that, I think we just need to have maybe some more employees working for the city to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nate? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm really interested in uh, instilling as much of a, a shared service model as possible, where we're, we're kind of using resources that we might alway, already have uh, to achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. So in addition to what everybody else is saying, I think uh, one of the things that we can do is we can partner with some of those uh, independent snow plowers, right? We can, we can maybe talk to like waste management and see if they can affix a plow to their to their vehicles. I, I'm not a snowologist, right? I don't know all of these things. Uh, but what I do know is that there are definitely opportunities out there that are, are not just hiring more people to the city per se, but finding and being able to, to, to kind of lean on some of these other resources that are existing in the community to, to achieve this outcome. So, yeah. Thank you, Nate. The next question, also around um, services. If elected, how would you improve the city's trash collection system? Um, some background that St. Paul recently extended its contract with the St. Paul uh, Haulers LLC, a consortium of five haulers serving the uh, St. Paul residents. And this is set to expire this month. And with none of the improvements yet in place that were recommended by the Garbage Advisory Committee. So how would you improve the city's trash collection system? We'll return to our structure at the, at the front of the uh, um forum tonight. So we'll begin this one with Pam. I uh, Trash is a big subject. I'm hearing it from most people when I door knock. And some people are okay with it, but many people aren't. So right now there's an 18-month extension, and unfortunately there is no opt-out out and shared carts. Um, and that's the way it is. What I would do if, if I would have initially been in there four years ago, I, I don't think I could accept something that did not offer opting out or share carting. I remember my grandma 20 years ago. She lived at 1460 Maryland Avenue. She had a little bag like this. She'd call me every week and say, Pamela, will you come and pick up my trash and put in your bin? Why would she have to pay? But under these rules, she would have to pay. So um, I think at one t we have to get to the point that we can opt out if necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nate? Yeah, um, th this is kind of complicated, right? Because we, we've got one provider for our trash collection system at the moment. Um, I think having another option is in everybody's best interest, but uh, I, I think it always opens up that kind of can of worms of um, how how well are they meeting the same standards that the city has set out. So I, I, I don't pretend to have any direct solutions to trash collection, but if anybody has great ideas, please let me know. I'm happy to hear them. Let's figure it out. Thank you, Nate. Uh, David? Yeah, I think uh, really the current trash debacle is a good example of what happens when we don't have mechanisms for listening to our citizens. I think a lot of people had voiced these complaints long ago, as Pam has already mentioned. Um, and again, it, it's really disappointing when we also have things like citizen advisory councils, and they don't lead to anything. Again, if there's no buy-in from above, we don't get changes. So that's really disappointing, and it speaks again to this idea of where's our voice. Um, the other part I'll say is I'll second Nate's idea, which is that we're in a bit of a pickle. I don't know that there's any good solution at this point because, again, we've driven out our other potential businesses. And so what happens when you're stuck with one provider? You don't really have accountability. We don't have mechanisms for creating accountability, and there's no easy way to correct that. So unfortunately, a lot of ideas again, but we're pretty stuck. Thank you, David. And then Wajung. 
Yeah, so everyone knows that negotiating with 15 haulers, the consortium, as they were called, was extremely difficult. But what we learned in that process was that people were paying, paying varying rates regardless of the weight that they were refusing. Um, so standardized rates across the city, folks in my neighborhood were definitely getting ripped off. Um, that was certainly one of the benefits. Um, we also reduced um, the wear and tear on our streets. Um, there's like a 9,000 point load to a truck that I've informed by an engineer recently, and that has greatly diminished our streets, and so having less trucks is always great. The upcoming contract, there's already been decisions that the council's been very public about. There is opt-out. There is cart sharing to encourage less waste. They're also bringing the customer service into the city of St. Paul, and we are also creating our own small fleet so that we can deploy and respond to emergencies and provide direct response to our um, constituents when there are complaints. Thank you. Okay, uh, the, the next question we have is, uh, when illegal activities occur in St. Paul business property, can the businesses be held accountable? Why or why not? In this one, we will begin with uh, Wajun. Uh, the answer is yes, that's through uh, licensing um, and DSI. So um, we have examples in Ward 5 that there are folks that um, have trouble with sort of unsavory behavior, but ultimately um, being a partner to the community is most important. Um, most recently, residents in Ward 5, along with um, advocacy groups and DSI, um, worked really hard together to hold a business um, accountable um, up on Larpender and Rice Street, if you're familiar. Um, and ultimately, um, the business was closed down. Um, there is a lot of violence that was happening in that parking lot. Um, so the answer is yes, the city absolutely can. Um, you know, there's a lot of options before that happens, but work um, to create penalties and consequences for businesses, one of which, of course, is also um, excessive con consumption fines. So if you're calling the police for a department, the police can issue um, fines that they have to pay um, in order to be held responsible for the activity that's happening on their private property. Thank you, Ajang. David? Yeah, I was going to ask, could you please uh, repeat the question? I didn't hear it fully. Oh. Um, when illegal activities occur on St. Paul business property, can the business be held accountable? Why or why not? Yes. Okay, I agree that, yes, the, the business can absolutely be, be held accountable. Um, my only uh, caveat to that is we have to be really careful when we're dealing with uh, businesses and uh, our relation to them from the, from the city. Um, it really depends on, on the specifics of that particular situation, but in general, yes, uh, they should be held accountable. Thank you, David. Uh, next we have Pam. Yes, I think they should be held accountable. I'm going to point to 444 Maryland Avenue as an example. Um, I take quite a big interest in this because I've been door knocking around there and residents have been extremely, extremely upset. They've been calling the city for many years. There's been multiple shootings. The police are aware. The police are, I think they are watching. They said they are, but um, I've talked to the owner. I've talked to employees. The employees are afraid, and I think there needs to be more done for businesses like this that continue year after year. We just had a shooting there two days ago. They need to be held accountable because people should not be living like this. So thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nate? Yeah, so the, the way I hear this, there, there are maybe two questions afoot. Um, the, the question of can businesses be held accountable, the, the answer is pretty straightforward. Yes, they can. The, the question I, I'm also hearing here is should businesses be able to be held accountable? Uh, and I think that is a, a kind of a, a trickier question to answer, right? Because it, I don't think it's uh, in every case going to be the, the fact that each business owner is is directly responsible for the conditions uh, on their particular property, right? So I think we have to make sure that we're exercising a lot of nuance when we talk about holding business owners account accountable or responsible for the activities that happen on their on their plots, because not everything is fostered by someone. Sometimes things happen at a place. Thank you, Nate. Um, in night. 2017, the Minnesota legislature requested that the 25 Twin Cities communities along the Mississippi River incorporate changes to their zoning along the river to better protect the river and preserve its value to the public. Minneapolis incorporated the standards in 2020, but St. Paul remains one of the six communities that has not yet adopted them. Would you prioritize adoption of the zoning changes? 
to protect the Mississippi River? Would you prioritize the adoption of the zoning changes to protect the Mississippi River? First, we have Wa Zhang. Yes, and you know, admittedly, I'm not terribly familiar, but I do recollect that, and I think um, the like my values here is that we are the top of the Mississippi, so anything that comes south of us is impacting like 33 million people, um, and so I think what's really important is that we maintain. Uh, like the environmental integrity of the Mississippi River. It's one of our greatest assets. It's also very sacred to this land. Um, but without further like specific examples of what those zoning changes are, but overall would support something that, again, maintains the environmental um, impacts, um, positive impacts on our Mississippi River. Thank you, Wajon. Pam? Yes, I would definitely support zoning to support or to help with the Mississippi River. It's a precious thing that we have in our city that's going past us and we need to protect the water and I really don't know why St. Paul hasn't already adopted the zoning that would do that so I'm going to say an easy yes thank you thank you Pam Nate yeah, without knowing the, the specifics of exactly what zoning changes we're, we're talking about here, uh, I can only give broad statements about supporting the, the river, right? Um, I, I think this makes sense. Um, but uh, again, without I don't know if this was like a, an audience question or something, if we can get uh, more information about what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, but I think everybody can generally agree that protecting the river is probably a good thing. Thank you, Nate. David? Yeah, I'll add to this idea that it's an easy yes. I think it's quite clearly, as we've all said, uh, a really integral part of our city's identity. And it's also an untapped resource while we're talking about the Mississippi. Um, when we think about downtown St. Paul, we don't get a lot of economic activity there. We haven't really figured out how to make use of the fact that we are a capital city that's located alongside and even on the Mississippi River. We have fantastic caves, fantastic recreational activities. And so I'd add to this that beyond thinking about just the, the conservation of, of water quality, that we also need to think about the Mississippi as a strategic resource for our city's identity and also our economic identity. Thank you, David. Um, next, do you support reparations? If yes, where would funds come from? Do you support reparations? If yes, where would funds come from? This question, we begin with Nate. Yeah, uh, so I, I do broadly support the, the idea of reparations. There is a historical precedent for this uh, throughout world history, right? Uh, and I think, you know, if we're talking about making sure that we're kind of uh, writing historical wrongs, right? Um, one of the places that we need to start is reparations, right? Um, I can trace my family's history back to when my great, 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 great grandma was paving roads uh, somewhere in Alabama after she was released from slavery, right? Um, and I, I think that the hard part is that second part of the question. Where do these dollars come from? In my estimation, this is, a, is something that is on the federal government, not city or local governments per se, uh, because this was a really federal exercise that was allowed for uh, hundreds of years. Thank you, Nate. Pam? I think that reparations are appropriate. Um, as Nate said, this is not. This goes back in history. 1865, the freed slaves were going to get land, and then Abraham Lincoln died, and the land was gone back to the plantation owners. I think that we should have it at the federal level. I do think that it's hard for a city to have to determine who are the descendants of slaves, and I think that this is definitely a federal level task but I do think that reparations are appropriate. We, um, it's a sad thing to think about your great grandma, great, great, or as Nate said, it goes back, but to think of any of your relatives being a slave, it's a very sad thing. So yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. David? I'll ask the question, uh, reparations to who? Um, oftentimes when we talk about reparations, we think exclusively in terms of African-American communities. I think that's in general the way that we think about them. I'd also argue we have native communities here. We have native and indigenous communities that have suffered. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not possible to compare suffering. But uh, if we're going to have that conversation and we're going to be real about it, let's be real about it, right? Let's include everybody and let's not pick who wins and who loses. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you, David. Moi, 
Uh, well, at the City of St. Paul, we had a reparations ad advisory committee, um, and they made a recommendation to the City Council to make a reparations commission. Um, and in those recommendations, it wasn't just sort of like monetary amount, but it was also around um, implementing reparations as a way to address racial disparities across housing, health care, education, and employment, um, as we just kind of talked about um, briefly, but uh, racism isn't even, and it impacts different descendants of enslavement very differently. Um, and I would support it. I think it's one of the best ways that we have, um, albeit at a municipal level, but to repair the harm that we've caused. And it could set a really great precedent, depending on the creative solutions that we offer, um, to also address our Native and Indigenous communities. Thank you. Thank you, Wajong. Our last question for this evening before closing statements is what makes you proud to be from Ward 5? What makes you proud to be from Ward 5? Seemed like a good close end to the various questions. This one we begin with David. Um, so I think immediately to my immediate neighbors, some of whom are here. Um, again, I'm uh, born and raised in Como, and we have fantastic neighbors. We have a fantastic community. Um, it's something that I would like to see really in, in other places of the world as well. Um, beyond that, in, in Ward 5, we have a lot of history. And I've been deeply involved with historic preservation movements. We have uh, the conservatory. We have right here the pavilion. We had the historic St. Andrews. We have the historic streetcar station. We have really parks. We have a lot of green space, really amazing places here in, in Ward 5. Um, and again, I'm speaking mostly from, from my neck of the woods here in Como, but I'll say I have a lot of love for uh, the rest of the ward myself. I used to teach tennis over at Arlington High School way back in the day. Uh, my brother worked at Lake Phelan, which is a little bit outside the ward actually, but uh, we've been around um, and I absolutely love our community. Um, thank you, David. Uh, next we have um, Wajan. Um, I love being a resident of Ward 5 for a lot of reasons, but one of which is that I, I feel very well represented um, in the foods that I have access to and what my neighbors look like, the type of jobs that they have, um, and the way that they're raising their families and their children and our community. I feel very well represented. Um, I'm really proud of the culture of care that Ward 5 has around each other, that is specifically in my neighborhood, um, my neighbors will literally come over and ask for a cup of sugar. Um, or ask for a recipe, or we have Monday night walks together. Um, and so there's a culture of care in Ward 5 that I really want to honor and continue on um, cultivating with all of you. Um, it's so important that we feel connected, and I think being a neighbor um, is one of the best attributes that we have in Ward 5 across the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. Pam? I love Ward 5 because um, there's a few reasons. I love the diversity of the different neighborhoods and my neighbors are Cambodian. I met them 30 or 40 years ago. There's all sorts of ethnic groups and um, the pride that people have. When you talk to people that lived on the east side years ago, there's east side pride and you see the same thing in Como neighborhood. I have talked to so many residents that said I've lived here all my life. They love it. Um, so I really like the beautiful Como Lake, how can you deny that? And to have that precious gem in the middle of, or in, not in the middle, but in Ward 5, that's so wonderful. And so I will close that with saying that for me, I just really love having all types of neighbors, all types of people around me. So I'm very happy to live in Ward 5. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nate? Yeah, uh, the people make Ward 5 great. I don't, I don't think that's a secret, right? Um, we, we have uh, uh, such a wide variety of folks from, from, from so many different walks of life um, that you can walk down the street and meet somebody from wherever uh, and, and have a, a genuine conversation that you might not have thought you would have. Um, but what I, I, I've grown to appreciate, it's hard to say that you're from, so I live uh, by, by Tin Cups on Rice Street. I live on Rice Street, right? Uh, and I, I, I promise you, I, I, like, I went to Washington when it was still Washington uh, Middle School, right? Uh, I went to Como for a year during my high school time, right? Uh, it, it has this this unique like kind of underdog mentality about it, right? Uh, I have loved that about my neighbors. I love that about just the the way that we are kind of are, right? Uh, a lot of times, especially in the North End, uh, we have a perception about us uh, about being a particular way or about living a particular way, but. 
Man, I, I I urge you all to talk to your neighbors, especially in the in the North End, because uh, we've we've got a lot of underdog in our area. Thank you, Nate. Um, in closing, uh, we apologize if your question was not asked. Uh, we encourage you to directly contact the candidate with your question. There were so many excellent questions, and we couldn't uh, fit them in the time frame. Uh, the closing statements will be given in reverse order from the opening statements. Please remember you have two minutes uh, to conclude your remarks. Uh, we begin closing statements with Nate. Surprised if I use my full two minutes here. Uh, I, I feel like I've already talked a lot, right? Uh, but if there's one thing that I could get across today is that if, if you're looking for somebody who has been kind of all across the political political spectrum, right? Uh, I, I have experience talking to, to folks no matter where they come from or what they believe. And my my whole position is I, I'm a, a, a team leader, right? I am a consensus builder. All I want is for all of us to kind of be on the same page and to know about the stuff before it happens happens. And I feel like if we can have that kind of shared trust, that, that shared value, um, and it, we can have something that we all kind of agree on, a path forward that we can all kind of agree on, uh, and maybe end a little bit of this uh, this this polarization that, that we hear so much about and we see a lot of. So uh, I, I just am here to, to be your next door neighbor that happens to have a little bit more authority, uh, but you, you won't catch me hiding, right? Again, you'll be able to find me at Tin Cups. You'll be able to find me at Tromperia. Oh, you, you won't be able to find me at Tin Cups. You're right. Uh, but <laughs> you'll be able to find me at, I live like kitty corner from there. It's, it's right there. It's a, it's a staple, right? But I'll be at Nanny's, right? You can find me. You can find me around. And I just want to be accessible and available for you all to, to tell you, and not to tell you anything, but to tell you I'm here for you. And I'll, I'll make the things happen. And if I can't make it happen, I'm going to tell you that too, but I'm going to tell you why. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Wajon? Yeah, so um, again, I've, I've door knocked thousands and thousands of doors year after year, and I've really heard how things have changed and how they've stayed the same. Um, the priorities in Ward 5 that I hear across the ward is that afford we have a great need for affordable housing across all the income ranges at every level of housing need, that we our youth wants us to combat climate change urgently. We have a plan, we have resources, we have the opportunity to address it in St. Paul. We want resource community first public safety that centers public health and mental, mental health solutions at the forefront. And lastly, our workers, um, our frontline workers and the city workers, they deserve fair contracts, thriving wages, workers protect, protections. And after the pandemic, um, they shouldn't have to demand that from us. It should be how we honor their work and their contributions for helping us survive. I was really inspired to run after we won the trifecta and I saw very bold women step forward into the fold to make progressive change. Um, that is why I'm here tonight, that's why I'm running. I'm running because I believe in a multiracial democracy. I believe because I'm uniquely poised to deliver on the promises for our communities, to be an effective leader that understands how to govern. Um, I have experience with the city budget, constituent services, legislative hearings. If you've ever had your neighbor complain about you not mowing your yard, that comes to the city council. Um, I'm deeply invested in the community engagement across this ward, um, and I feel like I've proven that time and time again, cycle after cycle. Um, but I will see you on the doors, and I look forward to speaking to all of you about the issues that matter most. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wajon. Next, we have Pam. I have a wealth of life experiences that I think are really relatable to so many people in Ward 5. I've been a single parent. I've been a renter. I've been a landlord. I'm a homeowner. Um, I've been a longtime employee. I've been a caregiver to my elderly parents so they could stay in their home and we didn't have to displace them. I can relate to people that are younger because I've been through so many things. And I can relate to people that are older, mostly because of my parents. And one of the things that I really feel is very important when I talk to people is when they when I talk to people, they're not complaining about these big, big things. They're, co they're complaining about simple things, their services. They're complaining about a nuisance property that they keep calling and there's drug busts, et cetera, or it's their roads or their boulevard. They're complaining about things that city council really needs to focus on, in my opinion. We need to um, make it so that people have everyday comfort in their home 
I am um, very open to people calling me. Even now, I have people texting me saying, Pam, there's a, a situation, and I say I'm not city council yet, so I can't really do much, but I try to help them. So the bottom line is I think that I understand people, and I really, really want to listen and have people know that I am not taking what they're saying and then poo-pooing it. I really care, so I just want to say thank you and have a good rest of your night. Thank you, Pam. David? Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm going to start by addressing uh, an issue that we haven't talked about yet, uh, which is that everyone on the city council, the current city council, is from the same political party. Our mayor is also a member of that same political party, and we don't get accountability. In general, I say this as a political scientist, we don't have political accountability when everybody is a member of the same team, everybody is working on the same issues. And so some of the people here have started off by you know, talking about our shared values that we have for the city. We don't get shared values if we only have a very exclusive club of people and we're not bringing in other voices. I think that's a common theme that we've talked about today. People who are feeling like they're left out of the city, like they're not included, they don't have a voice. And then at the end of this, we lack new ideas, really creative ideas. Uh, again, I identify as a progressive, but I, you know, I feel embarrassed about saying that in St. Paul because our progressive vision, it's very, very different from, you know, from what I value. And so, for example, some things that I've noted, um, you know, we're trying to get excited about the demolition of historic buildings in our city, things that people care about. People are telling us to get excited about destroying upwards of 1,000 trees along Summit Avenue to make bike lanes. People are trying to get us excited about a sales tax that we know to be regressive and that policymakers tell us to avoid because that hurts our most vulnerable residents. We're told to get excited about not paying our firefighters, the people who work for us, who are hard at work. We're not getting them a good contract. And so ultimately, I think what we need to do is be very, very cognizant of this and think, how can we generate new creative ideas for this city, especially given this political dynamic? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to remind the viewing audience that the views expressed on this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the sponsoring organizations. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, Doc and Paddle, and all the partner organizations, I would like to acknowledge and thank the candidates who are serving their community by the willingness to participate in the democratic process of running for office. Thank you. I would also like to thank the audience uh, for watching your candidates discuss issues that are important to our community. This forum has been video recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public on the SPNN YouTube page. Every vote counts. This year, Election Day is Tuesday, November 7th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. You have the option of voting early, which opened today, and voting by mail. For any questions on voting, go to the Ramsey County website, the Election and Voting section. Please remember to vote. Thank you and good night. Thank <laughs> you.